Suck, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, after doing my video on NAC, I've had a lot of Chooms and hair loss witchers asking me to cover another somewhat related compound called quercetin. Now, I've heard of quercetin before, even as a hair loss treatment, but when you're doing research on quercetin, you have to be very careful. You see, when I first started researching quercetin, I found that there are a lot of similar sounding substances that are related to quercetin. For example, there is also a chemical named quercitrin that is found in tartary buckwheat and in oak trees, as well as in some traditional Chinese herbal medicines, as we'll soon see. To make things even more confusing, though, there is also a substance called quercitron, which is a yellow dye obtained from the bark of the eastern black oak tree. However, the information on quercitron is so out of date that there is a note in Wikipedia that complains that the article is based on the 1911 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's the year President Ronald Reagan was born. Finally, there's also something called quercetinin that you can see here. So, if you look at the chemical formulas of quercetinin, quercitrin, and quercetin, you can see that they are all very similar chemically, and even the ancient Encyclopedia Britannica based Wikipedia article on quercitron indicates that quercitron contains quercitrin, and quercitrin itself breaks down easily into quercetin. Quercetin, I should say. So these are all very pretty similar chemicals. The substance you read about most, though, is quercetin, and that is because it is a substance that is found in many plants. Plants, and it is a type of flavanol, which is a type of chemical in the flavonoid family. Flavonoids are important pigments in plants, and they give plants and especially vegetables different colorations. Supposedly, on average in the United States, adults consume about 190 milligrams per day of flavonoids, and that includes lots of quercetin, because quercetin is found in many fruits and vegetables. For example, it is found in high amounts in capers, buckwheat, cilantro, and kale amongst other foods. It is also sold as a supplement because flavonoids have anti-inflammatory and antioxidative properties. However, even though flavonoids definitely have health benefits, like any supplement, there are a lot of wild claims made as to what it can treat. But here at Hair Cafe, we are interested in treatments for hair loss. So let's see if quercetin or its cousin quercitrin can be used to stop the slaphead curse once and for all. So, the first attempt to use quercetin to treat hair loss was in a study from 2012 titled, quote, Prevention and Treatment of Alopecia Areata with Quercetin in the C3H-HEJ Mouse Model, unquote. As you can tell from the title, it is an animal study and it is looking at a much rarer form of hair loss than androgenic alopecia. It is looking at alopecia areata, which is patchy hair loss thought to be due to an autoimmune disorder where a person's own antibodies start attacking their own hair follicles. So it is only superficially similar to androgenic alopecia and thus cannot be treated with a 5-AR inhibitor like finasteride. Instead, it is usually treated with steroids or minoxidil, but unlike Unlike androgenic alopecia, it can be a hard condition to treat. So, in this study, the investigators decided to test quercetin in specially bred mice that have a high incidence of alopecia areata. The investigators actually injected the quercetin into the mice rather than giving it to the mice topically. They compared the quercetin mice to control mice and looked at treating mice who already had alopecia areata, and also whether quercetin prevented alopecia areata. As it turns out, the results were pretty spectacular. All the mice with spontaneous alopecia Alopecia areata improved with quercetin, and you can see an example in this figure here where the mouse on the left got no treatment and the mouse on the right got quercetin. The bottom row shows the microscopic appearance, and basically, the quercetin eliminated the inflammation compared to the control mouse. The next figure shows the results with mice who were given a heat treatment to induce alopecia areata. And again, the mice on the right who got quercetin did not lose their hair, whereas 24% of the mice on the control group did lose their hair. When they looked at spontaneously occurring alopecia areata, 18% of placebo mice developed severe alopecia whereas none of the quercetin mice developed severe, severe alopecia. A few mice on quercetin developed focal alopecia, but overall the results were pretty dramatic and statistically significant. Quercetin did a good job of, pre of preventing and treating alopecia areata, at least in this mouse model study. 
The researchers, what they felt is that quercetin inhibit a protein called nuclear factor kappa B that stimulates inflammation. But we'll, we'll get back to some of the proposed mechanisms of how quercetin works in a moment. But anyways, we have this one study in mice with alopecia areata. But surprisingly, even though this study is now 10 years old, I haven't seen any human data on using quercetin for alopecia areata. And maybe that's because alopecia areata is a rare enough condition that it is difficult to recruit subjects for a study of it. But I'd sure be curious to see if quercetin is effective for alopecia areata in human beings. Well, as I have already made clear, alopecia areata is not androgenic alopecia, which we know is due to the effects of DHT on genetically susceptible hair follicles on the scalp. But maybe quercetin might still help with androgenic alopecia by working more as a general growth stimulant like minoxidil does. Or maybe it might target the downstream effects of DHT, like DHT's effects on growth factors like TGF-beta, or effects on pathways like the WNT WNT pathway, which we know is inhibited by DHT and androgenic alopecia. So even though finding treatments for alopecia areata is obviously very important, I'm sure what most of us are interested in, in here is if there's any evidence that quercetin works in hair disorders besides alopecia areata. Well, let's take a look at not one, but two studies from our good friends in Good Korea. And both studies are from the same group of researchers, Dr. Jae-Yoon Kim and his associates. The first study is called, quote, Hair Growth Promoting Effects of Hatunia Cordata, Extract in Cultured Human Hair Follicle Dermal Papilla Cells, unquote. And it was published in 2019. This study focuses on an herb that is used in Southeast Asian cuisine called Hotunia Cordata, also known as fish mint, fish leaf, chameleon plant, and a bunch of other names as well. Supposedly, it has a bit of a fishy taste, but fortunately doesn't actually contain fish or any other animal products, so it is vegan, despite maybe not being the most pleasant tasting spice out there. Anyways, what it is, it is an herb that has been used in traditional Chinese medicine. So Dr. Kim and his fellow researchers decided to see what effects it had on hair growth and on the biochemistry of hair follicles. The short summary was that this herb stimulated the growth of cultured human hair follicles and also stimulated the expression of numerous growth factors. So whatever was in this herb seemed to be a hair growth stimulant. So the results of the study were so interesting that the researchers decided to figure out what was actually in this Hotunia cordata herb and then repeat the exact same study with the active ingredient of, of Hotunia cordata. It turns out that the major constituent of Hotunia cordata is quercetin, which is a close cousin of quercetin. And actually, Hotunia cordata also contains quercetin, but Dr. Kim decided to redo the study using using just quercetin. Thus, in 2020, Dr. Kim and the Good Koreans published, quote, Quercetin stimulates hair growth with enhanced expression of growth factors via activation of MAPK slash CREB signaling pathway, unquote. This was a study of the effects of quercetin on cultured hair follicles, but it was also a detailed study of the bio biochemistry of how quercetin actually works in the cells. In the previous study on the herb Hodunia cordata, the herb prolonged the antigen growth phase of cultured human hair follicles. In the present study, they reproduced the results of the Hodunia cordata herb just using quercetin alone. Using various techniques, the researchers also measured the levels of different growth factors in the hair follicles that could be responsible for the beneficial effects of quercetin. They found that quercetin increased cell viability similar to the effects of minoxidil shown as MNX in this figure. Quercetin also increased mitochondrial activity and increased ATP levels. This implies that quercetin increases energy levels in the cells because mitochondria produces ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate, which is the main source of energy within our cells. In addition, a protein called BCL2 was enhanced by quercetin. This is a protein that prevents cell apoptosis. Apoptosis is what's known as a programmed cell death. It's actually a 
way for a cell to commit suicide on purpose. You see, at the end of the antigen growth phase of the hair cycle, hair follicle cells basically kill themselves in what's called the catagen phase, and then the hairs sit around in the telogen resting phase for the next three months until they fall out and a new hair cycle begins with a new antigen growth phase. BCL2 prevents the cell death, so it prolongs the antigen growth phase. So by stimulating BCL2, quercetrin stimulates the antigen growth phase. Quercetrin also lowers another intracellular protein, which is literally called BAD-BAD, which causes apoptosis. Overall, the researchers found numerous potentially beneficial effects of quercetrin on many different growth factors and factors affecting cell viability, as seen in these two graphs right here. So, the machinery of cells that controls apoptosis and the hair cycle is obviously extremely complex, as you can see in this figure here. Here you see the BCL2 and BAD that quercitrin affects, and here we see the NF kappa B that quercetin affects. Over here we see the famous WIT pathway that is the target of several new drugs in the pipeline for androgenic alopecia that I have all covered on this channel. And right next to the WIT pathway, we have, believe it or not, another pathway called the sonic hedgehog pathway. So who says biochemists have no sense of humor? Furthermore, it's no surprise that since quercetin and quercetin citrin have so many complex effects on the cellular level that some researchers have wondered if there was even any way it could have any effect on the coronavirus. So could quercetin succeed where so many other treatments have failed? Well, we'll get back to the hair studies in a moment, but since this is an important subject, let's briefly take a little side trip to look at quercetin and COVID-19. There are two studies that I am aware of looking at quercetin and COVID. Both studies were published in 2021. The first looked at just 42 patients with COVID and half the patients got standard treatment and the other half received a form of quercetin called quercetin phytosome. The study was randomized but not blinded, meaning the investigators and patients knew which treatment they were taking. After two weeks of quercetin treatment, 16 patients tested negative for COVID and 12 had all symptoms resolved. In the control group that received only standard COVID treatment, only two patients tested negative and only four had improvement of symptoms after two weeks. However, this was an extremely small study and may be susceptible to bias since it wasn't blinded. Also, it turns out that even though this study was randomized, by chance the control group had older patients than the quercetin group and of course everyone knows by now that the the severity of COVID is higher the older you are. So this is not a very convincing study. So the second study using quercetin for COVID has the advantage in that it was a much larger study and it included 429 patients who were randomized to standard treatment or quercetin. Quercetin improved sub-lab parameters like platelet counts, but unfortunately it had no effect on COVID outcomes. So sadly, quercetin for COVID probably doesn't do squat, but I'm sure somewhere out there there are going to be at least a few crazy people on the internet who insist that it actually is a viable treatment and the reason it isn't mainstream is because of a big pharma conspiracy theory by Dr. Fauci as well as lizard people from Proxima Centauri B. Well, getting back to the subject of hair, what can we conclude from the data I went over? My conclusion is there's lots of interesting theoretical data but no actual outcome data in human subjects. Until real clinical studies are done, quercetin and its related chemical quercitrin remain potential but unproven growth stimulants so far. It would be nice to have some sort of alternative minoxidil, perhaps one that can even be stacked with it similar to what you can do with stamoxidine, but clearly more work and research needs to be done here. There's one final loose end though that I think needs to be addressed on this subject. Certain websites claim that quercetin is a natural 5-AR blocker and can thus lower DHT. Now, there are naturally occurring 5-AR blockers amongst plants and fungi. An example of this is the reishi mushroom that I did a video on recently that I'll link below. But there is no strong evidence that quercetin is a 5-AR blocker. For example, the website healthline.com states, quote, in preclinical studies, quercetin has been shown to inhibit the production of DHT from testosterone by blocking the action of the enzyme alpha-5 reductase and decreasing oxidative stress, unquote. 
However, the reference they cite is this article here, but this appears to be a complete misreading of the article. In the article, the authors are talking about a metabolite of quercetin called dehydroxytoluene, which they confusingly abbreviate as DHT. And this has nothing at all to do with dihydrotestosterone, which is what we usually mean when we say DHT, especially when we're talking about hair loss. This is honestly the most amateurish mistake I've seen in hair loss research since some Portuguese guy on Reddit thought that sulforaphane was the same thing as sulfotransferase. But anyways, the point is, is that this article has nothing to do with blocking the 5-air enzyme. This same Healthline.com article quotes another study and says, quote, for example, when combined with a commonly prescribed medication to treat hair loss, quercetin was shown to decrease DHT production in rats, unquote. However, here they quote another study that looked at the effects of combining finasteride and quercetin on rat prostate glands. The investigators found the opposite of what the Healthline site says. They found that adding quercetin to finasteride actually increased serum DHT compared to the effects of finasteride alone. To quote, Compared with finasteride alone, the finasteride quercetin combined treatments increase serum DHT levels, unquote. So if anything, quercetin might counteract finasteride and accelerate hair loss. But this is all still very theoretical. Since there are no human studies on quercetin, we don't know if it is effective in treating androgenic alopecia or if it could make things worse. I guess one reason I am very skeptical, though, is that if quercetin prevents hair loss and is so common in the food we eat, then why does anyone ever go bald for that matter. I mean, supposedly quercetin is one of the most common, if not the most common flavonoid in the human diet, and we ingest an average of 10 to 100 milligrams of quercetin every day just through the food we eat. Using supplements, you can take a lot more of it in, and it's probably safe to take even at high doses, but evidence from clinical trials that it is an effective hair growth stimulant doesn't exist. I think it deserves to be looked at with clinical trials, particularly in people with the rare condition of alopecia areata, where it looks very useful in the animal studies at least, but since it is a natural substance, it's unlikely any drug company would foot the bill and shell out the amount of money needed to do these clinical trials if quercetin isn't something that could be profitable. So sadly, I do not think quercetin will ever go beyond the realm of just theory. And even based on theory alone, the evidence is conflicting with some evidence showing that it might help, while some evidence shows it might hurt. But without any human data to verify all this, we can't come to any conclusions about its efficacy as a hair loss treatment. Maybe it would be worth a try if you have alopecia areata, but even if you do, chances are a clinically proven growth stimulant like, like minoxidil will already work a lot better than quercetin. So, sorry to say it, my fellow hair loss witchers, but this stuff is most likely completely worthless. But the research was nevertheless interesting, and at least the good Koreans weren't trying to do anything shady like scam desperate Redditors out of $70,000 to fundraise development of a worthless topical based on broccoli sprouts. So, oh well, yet another natural treatment we can throw into the fail basket. Hopefully next time I can report on something a bit more promising, but until then, good luck on the path, my fellow hair loss witchers. I'll see y'all next time. Take care.